so I, I think a very important lesson is the importance of a real customer development. And so customer development's become a little bit of a fashionable term right now. And I think a lot of people equate that to just listen to customers. Uh, but from, from my experience at, say, Motive as an entrepreneur, one thing that we did is before we even had a product, we went to customers and said it cost $50,000 to join our early access program. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we did that was if we were going to spend decades building this software in a company, we wanted to know we had a value proposition that was so strong and that customers had so much pain that they, that they were crazy enough to spend $50,000 on a startup company that didn't have a product yet. So we, in, in the early days, we did what I called a time and motion study. So all of the founders went and visited 30 prospects before we wrote a single line of code. Okay, and so we had five founders, and we would just go in with the same standard list of about 10 to 20 questions. And the goal was to not become a product expert, but to become a problem expert. And so what I find in Silicon Valley is a lot more people can articulate the product they sell than the problem they solve. And uh, becoming an expert in the problem is the key to unlocking a real value proposition. And so uh, to me, that's the essence of customer development is becoming a problem expert and then creating customers in parallel with the product rather than say, let me build something and then go get customers. I get a lot of uh, startups that come in and say, uh, I haven't built anything yet. Do you think this is a good idea? And my answer to that is always, how the heck should I know? I'm not a customer. And so if I'm not a customer or a prospect, my opinion's interesting but irrelevant. So facts are facts, and they only exist outside the building. And uh, what people need to do is get outside the building and turn assumptions into facts by interacting with customers, and not by just interviewing them, but by forcing them to make choices about what parts of the value proposition they'll pay for, what parts they won't. I think that the, the biggest mistakes that we've made have been when we chased a fad or when we did something because we thought that the market thought we needed to do it. And uh, where we've had the best results are when we've always realized that, that love conquers all. It's, it sounds a little bit corny, but um, startups are a situation where you have to will that company into existence and you're going to encounter all kinds of obstacles along the way. You're going to encounter inertia. You're going to encounter bozo, stupid people who won't listen. Uh, you're going to encounter bad, random luck. And it's going to be your love of the idea that sustains you through all of that. If you don't really love the idea and the opportunity, you'll, you'll give up at, the, at those signs of trouble. But if you're positive you're right, uh, you just keep going regardless. He, he was in a great mindset because the, the, the other mistake I see people make is they hedge when they should focus. And great entrepreneurs focus. So uh, I remember a movie, City Slickers, where Curly says, you know, the secret of life is one thing. You've got to find your one thing. And uh, I believe that's true of entrepreneurship. The, the fundamental asymmetric attack weapon of the entrepreneur is the willingness to focus where the big company is not willing to focus. And where the entrepreneur gets in trouble is when they spread their energy out across a lot of initiatives. Uh, the winning idea is to find the one thing that you're most confident in and just go all in on that one idea. And that's why I think that, that Tony was able to make Zappos. That among many other reasons. When you're out of money and there's no plan B and there's no alternative but to succeed, you get pretty focused. Like once you're there, you know, once, once you've jumped out of the plane, the chute has to open, right? There's no plan B. And so, you know, that, that, you know we, we, we like the, the entrepreneurs who are so positive they're right about their one thing that that's all they want to do. So we, um, when I was at Motive, our first product was very successful. So we had more than $60 million in bookings in 18 months. Well, then uh, everybody was going public. It was almost the end of the bubble. And we said, well, you know, we need an e-business strategy. So we bought another company in town to give us some e-business pixie dust. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the right thing to do. It, it was distracting and confusing to our strategy. Fortunately, it didn't take the company down, but it was 
six months of energy that was devoted to that that we could have been devoting to just running the table in our market. And we gave competitors an opportunity to get more traction. Uh, I mean, ultimately, we did fine, but we could have done even better than fine. And so, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's a regret I have, is that we, we bought a company because we wanted it to look good for the market. When I look at an entrepreneur, one, one question I ask is whether they have this certain it factor around scoring. And, and I use an analogy of a quarterback. So uh, Sam Bradford, I'm a big Oklahoma Sooner fan. Sam Bradford was the quarterback of that team. Every time he gets inside the 20-yard line, they score a touchdown. And some entrepreneurs are that way. When they, when, they see an entre when they see an opportunity, they convert it to something good every time. And some always have a legitimate reason for why they couldn't, but they just don't quite get there. They don't, just don't quite, quite complete the last mile. And so um, I just thought that Evan and Kevin and Asman just had that hard-to-define intangible of, you know, when they get close to scoring, when they get close to converting an opportunity, they just will. Uh, and sometimes you just look at an entrepreneur and you say, that person's a stud and he's going to make me money. And they just seem to have that quality about them. I can't even explain how it happens. I, I think that it's, I think entrepreneurs are more born than made. Uh, I think people try to teach entrepreneurship and there are certainly disciplines around it. But I think some entrepreneurs just have that uh, MacGyver uh, tendency, you know, that, that TV show MacGyver where he can escape from any prison or create a bomb out of a cactus or whatever the case may be. Some entrepreneurs just have this ability to just improvise their way to a good outcome. And I don't think that can be taught. I think that the disciplines of managing risk and the disciplines of fundraising can be taught. But the discipline of, guess what, we have to MacGyver an outcome right now. It can't be taught. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was at Motive, we had 30 minutes left before the end of the quarter, and we were $2 million shy. And there was one customer who I called the CIO of, and I knew that he liked single malt scotch. Uh, so I called him and I said, if you call me back in 10 minutes, I'll give you a bottle of single malt scotch. And uh, he calls me back laughing and goes, that's like the funniest thing I've heard this quarter you just got to the front of the line and purchasing. Congratulations, right? We closed a $3 million deal. Well, there's no economic theory about that, right? It's, it's just, okay, we got 30 minutes left. We got to do something. And so um, the thing that I liked about those three that you mentioned was I felt like they just sort of had that chromosome of, uh, you know, they can MacGyver a good outcome when there's, 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 there's no handbook for how to do that. You just have to improvise.